You are listening to the Palestine in America podcast. I'm your host, Nader Hamoud. I'm joined by my co-host and our politics edition guest editor, Rasha Mubarak of Unbought Power. On today's episode, we talk to U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights Executive Director, Ahmed Abu Zneid. How are you doing, Ahmed? Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Ahna wa Yo, this is fire. Like, I'm so excited to be in a space with someone that, like, not only has led so many movements in our community and outside our community, but really a friend and a comrade. And to be with you and Ahmed, Nadir and Ahmed, like, it is straight fire. So we appreciate Ahmed. We know that you have a lot on your plate, especially being the new executive director of USCPR as Mabruk. So we do truly appreciate you being with us today. Yeah, yeah, we definitely value your time, Ahmed. Thanks so much. And like, just to echo on what she was saying, I've, I've been a huge fan of yours for such a long time and uh, been meaning to reach out for an interview for PIA for a long time. And I think this is just like the perfect timing and I appreciate you giving us the space to talk. So uh, again, hey, thank uh, you. Hey, Allah Barak Fikum, thank you. I'm humbled, you know, it's, it's always, uh, you know, great to be able to put a contribution into the world and for, for our community to appreciate it. You know, that's, we always want to make our community proud. So thank you for the kind words and it's a pleasure to connect with y'all. And uh, don't, you know, I don't think I'm sleeping on PIA. You know, I see the work y'all are doing over there too. And so to have this convo with you all and Unbought Power, Russia Mubarak is, uh, is, is, you know, um, not a chat, um, you know, that I would have missed even on a Friday night. So here we are. <laughs> It is Friday night, and, and we are definitely taking some valuable time out of our late Friday night to talk about some very important things, and definitely joined by a Palestinian everybody should know. Uh, I just want to start out by asking you what, you know, where along your life did you decide, hey, this is the work that I want to do. I want to immerse myself in, you know, fighting for my people's rights. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm always really, really excited to talk about this one because I think um, I think for it's it's probably a bit outside of the box for many Palestinians um, and and probably not what most people would expect being that um, I've really um, been able to now work within the Palestinian movement. But my first um, really life changing moment as it relates to political activism and organizing and social justice was actually after the killing of a young black boy named Martin Lee Anderson in a juvenile boot camp in Bay County, Florida. So you're talking about Northwest Florida. And for those that don't know Florida politics or how Florida lays as a land, um, you know, you think about Miami and Orlando as like Disneyland and beaches and, and um, tourism. Well, most, mostly the rest of Florida is the South. And um, that was very much true for Northwest Florida and where Martin Lee Anderson grew up. And, what happened was this young man, we got wind that this young man died due to complications of sickle cell anemia. Uh, this was what was described in the autopsy reports. Complications from sickle cell anemia was the cause of death. Um, and, and it really stood out to many um, black classmates of mine and comrades that, that were letting me know, like, that's not really how it goes down. You know, you don't really just drop dead due to complica complications. There needs to be like ex exacerbation. There needs to be like a something that that really propels the condition to be something that can be um, perhaps fatal. And what we ended up uncovering via a video that was eventually released was that the guards in the boot camp actually beat this kid. They were punching him and kicking him. And and then he stopped breathing. And I, watching that video and also thinking about how there were people intentionally looking to cover it up immediately connected for me as a Palestinian. I, I, I immediately thought back to the lack of justice given um, after the brutalization of Palestinian bodies and communities. And so I, I was jumped, you know, I, I had to jump up into action along with several other folks. At that time, Governor Jeb Bush was the governor of Florida and we took over his office. And last thing I'll note just on that subject, because it was a, sp a particular moment that really crystallized for me that experience. And it was after we had occupied the governor's office for about 36 hours, we slept on the floor. We were, you know, really out of it at that point in time. We were singing freedom songs. And those of us who have been a part of the black radical tradition of, of organizing spaces, you know how much song 
and culture and art means to the movement. So we were on the ground, literally arms locked, singing freedom songs um, for Martin Lee Anderson. And then in through the doors uh, burst Benjamin Crump, um, who was on each side had one of Martin Lee's parents. And um, that was special because one of our demands at that time was for Governor Jeb Bush to meet with the family and begin to make amends. You know, we had several demands, shut down the boot camps, you know, um, arrest those involved, et cetera, et cetera. But that moment right there was when we saw one of our demands being met right before our eyes, after we had been told that Governor Jeb Bush was in Iraq, right? He, he was actually in Iraq visiting one of those military bases throwing support to, um, you know, that war. And so really interesting full circle to think about bringing that governor back from Iraq uh, from an illegal, unjust war and occupation of, of the Iraqi people's um, lands and, and calling him back to do um, his job um, after, after yet another black boy had been brutalized and stolen from us um, in Florida. So that was the moment, and I'll, and I'll stop there. Goosebumps. There's so much power in that story. And just, um, I was actually on a virtual space today with Ben Crump because as you know Aramis Ayala the first um black state attorney in Florida she's leaving but we have another you know Monique Worrell so it, it's just interesting to that Ahmed like I think I love that you started off with that story because that solidarity between the Palestinian community and um the black liberation movement is not new right it's it's been since this inception of this country when folks were forced to migrate here and be enslaved. But you are also one of the main people that have paved the way in our generation and have really, um, before it was trending on Twitter, before it was something that people wanted to be a part of, I look at you and I see, especially someone coming from Florida, you know, that story, plus Trayvon Martin, you're a co-founder of Dream Defenders. So how, what does solidarity mean to you? It's, it's, and I think it's important for folks to hear because like you exemplify true solidarity and not just like photo op, but really how you've shown up for the community and how you've led the other like black and brown communities to show up for us. Yeah, um, yeah, I knew, I mean, it's great to be in a space where that can resonate, where that sort of story can resonate for people. Um, I just want to say, like, before, you know, I get to my answer that, you know, it's it's also really inspiring to see Ben Crump's evolution, um, you know, as a as a national leader in, in civil rights, you know, because he's been doing it for decades. And, and to see people that you've been struggling with for decades be elevated and have an opportunity to continue to, to fight, but on a larger stage is really inspiring. So definitely wish the best to, to Brother Ben Crump and all of those folks that have been dedicated to the movement for decades. So in, in, in relation to that, yeah, the, the historic connection between the radical left, the black radical tradition, and the Palestinian liberation movement is truly a special one. And, you know, I actually learned about it, um, you know, as I was doing the work. So I, even I think for someone like me, you know, being able to go back and get new knowledge about the roots of this this tradition um, have been really, really empowering and inspiring. And I think, you know, solidarity for me at that moment with Martin Lee Anderson, I, I didn't, it, it, like the words hadn't arrived for me at that moment, but really what solidarity meant was I recognized that this system that stole Martin Lee Anderson from us, the same system that took Trayvon Martin from us, um, is being replicated all across the world. Um, and, and, it, and it takes on sometimes a bit of a different tint or a bit of a different formation, but ultimately there is a system that deems certain people disposable, um, certain people worthy of experiment, certain people worthy of othering. And, and that was very clear to me from my experience living in Palestine um, and seeing the way I experienced life and people around me experienced life. And then when I came back to the US, seeing the way Black Americans, um, Native Americans, Latino Americans, so many of the folks who have been otherwise here, seeing how it impacted them. So I really view, viewed Martin Lee Anderson as a struggle for the same system um, or against the same system of, of subjugation and oppression and for the same 
ideals and values of freedom, justice, and love for all. Can we talk about uh, your time in Palestine and kind of, you know, just describe what that was like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can I can point to just a few, you know, like a handful of experiences that really would um, communicate to you what what that experience was like. So I was aged, I was born in Al Quds, um, but at age one, my parents brought me to the U.S. for obvious reasons, right? For the reasons that many of our our, our parents and family members escaped, uh, you know, the Nakba and the Naqsa occupation oppression um, to provide a better opportunity. At, at age seven, though, my parents made the decision that we would move back to Palestine. And, and you know, as a seven-year-old growing up, I would say lower middle class in the U.S., um, you, you really felt like, uh, it, or I felt very privileged. I thought like that life was really beautiful in the U.S. It was perfect in a way. I didn't see oppression, systemic oppression at that age. But at seven, we flew to Tel Aviv Ben Gurion Airport. And immediately after getting off the flight, <clears throat> myself and my mother were escorted to a um, security room where the soldiers strip searched us. And so when you're seven now and you're undergoing your first strip search and watching Israeli soldiers ruffle through your luggage, you're, you're now beginning to see systemic violence and oppression in a very real way. Um, not knowing that that's what it was, but knowing that there was something really inherently wrong about this power dynamic, about this situation that had a child next to his mother being strip searched. And then, you know, you go on uh, to, to live there for the next five years and, and several things had stood out to me. Um, Jesse Jackson visited uh, Al Khalil um, and my father was a part of organizing that delegation. And so I got a chance to uh, meet with Jesse Jackson and his wife. Um, and of course I was a kid. And so, you know, it's not like I was involved in political conversation. Um, I was more observing, but after the event, we're sitting outside and somehow there had been somehow quote unquote clashes that moment between the Israelis and, you know, Palestinians who were outside protesting and, and really like maybe celebrating this moment of Jeff, Jesse Jackson's arrival. And they began firing tear gas. And, and I remember, so my first time in memory dealing with tear gas was um, it being shot at us and me being rushed onto a bus with Jesse Jackson, his wife, my parents, to get away from the tear gas. Um, and and I, look, I look back at when we took over the, the, um, the Capitol as Dream Defenders under Rick Scott, Jesse Jackson came and spent some moments with us. And I thought about how crazy is it that wow. uh, we were together in Al-Khalil, you know, 20 plus years ago because he took the moment out to come and visit and build with my people and and here i was you know after um the the, the trayvon um incident um really attempting to do my best to be in solidarity um yeah I, i'll pause there just in case there was anything there's one more memory though that comes comes to mind so i'll, I'll pause just in case the one thing that i i, I can't i, I don't want to forget to ask about and it's perfect was like you co-founded, you know, the Dream Defenders and the idea of taking, you know, people to Palestine, was that just like a natural thing for you? Like, or like, had you been thinking about it for a long time or like, how did re that idea come together? And because I think it was just so perfect and it's just like a, I don't know, I just love the idea and it's just so beautiful to see other people like, you know, see our people for who they really are, you know? And yeah. So, yeah, thanks for lifting that up. I mean, I, I considered it a privilege. It was very special to be there for those moments, um, to witness how Palestinians appreciated the delegations and how our delegates appreciated like Palestinian people and culture and the struggle and, and the fight for liberation. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I told the first set of delegates and, and it was very true because I was speaking from the heart. I, I kind of like, you know, when you're going through something, um, you know there's people you can depend on people that have your back and you so you you think about like people you can bring along with you in your struggle you know that that would have your back and stand up with you um for what's right and i just remember telling them like i always dreamed about taking um my crew like my people like from here with me there to observe what like what is oftentimes indescribable for people um even after they've seen it um, and witnessed it with their own eyes. But like, 
what was really beautiful is, so my father took the delegation of, of, of FSU students while I was at Florida State University. Somehow my father, someone, my father at the time, I think was in the, the PLO office in DC. And somehow, some way there was a, a delegation that evolved out of Florida State University that my father was able to take some students over there. And so that was in the back of my mind. I was like, oh, you know, like I remember, you know, dad taking those students and thinking like, you know, when we founded the Dream Defenders, I was wearing a kafiya. So we sparked conversations about Palestine the very first day that we built the Dream Defenders. And that conversation continued. And so, you know, this thought process around, you know, taking a crew from here and then Dream Defenders being that vehicle, that vessel to do that work, um, really evolved pretty uh, naturally, pretty organically. The last thing I'll note about this, because it was really mind blowing for me, um, and really affirming of the work that, that we were doing and that all of us, you know, um, here today have contributed to is, um, I was sitting the night before the delegation, the first delegation started, I was sitting in Amman um, with my father. Um, we had arranged to meet up in Amman right before I crossed over into Palestine because um, as many of you, um, uh, you know, have to experience the occupation, I experienced certain forms of the occupation. I have a West Bank ID, so I can only travel through Amman um, into Palestine. So I was, I was in Amman, my father was there, and we were going, you know, we had dinner and we sat down for some shag, you know, typical, um, you know, moments that you share. And then we started to talk about the delegation. I shared with him how excited I was that I was taking the folks that founded Black Lives Matter and the New York City uh, Justice Coalition um, uh, and, and, um, and, and Hands Up United and Mark Lamont Hill. I was so excited. I was sharing with them what we were doing. And somehow I think I noted how inspired I was by the stor story of Stokely Carmichael, AKA Kwame Ture. And at that moment, my dad blew my mind when he, he like, let me know that he knew personally uh, Kwame Ture and Soka Carmichael and, and a part, it had been a part of like the young band of like Fatah organizers that were in the US that were able to organize for Kwame Ture to go visit with uh, Arafat. And so uh, that was really a beautiful moment because it, it really just, um, again, affirmed the work that we were doing, but really affirmed for me personally that I was, I was in the right place in the right time and, and on the right trajectory. No, I did not know that. <laughs> I love that. That's crazy. It's cra it's like it's crazy, but it's also like it makes sense, right? Like oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I literally um after yesterday's Supreme Court decision about uh, Brandon, like I I pick up my book of Black Power and just like you know immerse myself in that just to like remind. Um, myself of just like what's possible and so that's beautiful that like you know our parents the generations have been reimagining this free world um for so many of us i feel emotional <laughs> but just um how everything is so interconnected and ahmed like something we talk about a lot in movement is just trying to achieve a freer world right and understanding that the work we do today we might not see in our lifetime but it's there to like help build some kind of power of that is towards this plight of freedom and liberation for those who come after us so when you think about a free world what does that look like to you but also a lot of us didn't want to get into this political world and like how has politics um how do you see politics playing a role in that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll be brief with the vision for freedom. Um, you know, I think it's very simple. We would see all walls fall. Um, we would see uh, prisons be demolished. You know, we would see uh, people having freedom of movement, um, freedom to dream and, and how, allow their ambitions um, to be dictated by um, the beauty of life and their passions within it, um, as opposed to, you know, work that we find ourselves in, which, you know, I, I consider it a privilege to be able to, um, to do this work, to dedicate my, my life to fighting for uh, a better possibility for, for Palestine, but for the entire world. But the reality is these jobs would be obsolete. You know, those of us who are 
you know, activists and organizers um, can be free to do whatever it is that we dreamt of doing when we were kids before we recognized that, that we had some work to do that we had to handle before we could, you know, breathe as we wanted to breathe or, or dream as we wanted to dream. So like I think about film for me as something that I would have been um, more heavily involved in or um, passionate about maybe even as a form of education. And it's something I'm, I'm able to work on right now. I have a, a passion project, a side project that, that I'm working on that one day we'll talk about a lot more in the future, inshallah. But, um, you know, we'd have more opportunities to do this. And I think about like, um, you know, just the ability to breathe and enjoy life and to kind of let your shoulders down um, is something that many of us have not given ourselves the liberty um, to be able to do it. It's because we, we see ourselves as engaged in a fight for a better tomorrow. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll pause there. I think, I think the reality is though, the three of us could spend all day talking about what that freedom would look like. And what I guarantee you is there will be a big ass party in Philistine um, that everyone is welcome to. There's going to be a lot of Debka and Thobes and, uh, and all, all the shea you can drink. Uh, but politics, um, look, politics is a necessary evil um, or a necessary um, forum or a necessary battle that, you know, those of us who want to effectuate change have to be involved in. And so it's, it's an ugly and dirty game. There's a lot of things about politics I absolutely detest. Um, and actually coming from a family where, you know, my, my father was heavily involved in politics. It was very clear to me it was something I didn't necessarily want um, a relationship to when I grew up. But then again, just like many, just like folks on this call, um, and like many Philistinia, we recognize that like this dynamic exists whether we like it or not, and whether we're engaged with it or not. And so, you know, do I want to have a role in, in hopefully eliminating the system, the status quo, um, life as is under occupation? Absolutely. Sign me up for that. Um, and what that means for us politically is different on the ground in Palestine than it is for us here domestically in the U.S. So, I, you know, um, and, and, you know, challenges, huge challenges in both. But I can speak to the United States of America um, and the political realm we've been involved in here. And, and I'm excited to say that due to the work of folks like Russia um, and, you know, grassroots organizers all across the country, um, you know, the PYMs, the SJPs, the, the, the Dream Defenders, the Movement for Black Lives, like due to all of these people's contributions in the last decade and, and so many of our parents and their generations institution building and, and, and organizing before, you know, we have the most pro-Palestine Congress we've ever seen in the United States of America. And it doesn't mean that we've already won in Congress, but the reality is there is a, a, a practical reality that exists in Congress today that did not exist um, 10 years ago, and in fact, many people uh, figured would be impossible. And so the, 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 the winds in politics are slow grinding. Um, we're going to have to have some long-term visions and some short-term steps to get us there. Um, but I guarantee you we're better off figuring out how to impact within that system um, than, than simply boycotting that system. And I know that that is sometimes how people feel. I was I was gonna ask the, like earlier if you ever had a chance to because you've been doing the work for so long to look back on you know how far you've come the movements come but it sounds like you have done some reflecting on that and you you kind of know you know you're aware of what has gone on in the last you know ten or fifteen years um, but uh, that leads me to my next question as my daughter Janine. <laughs> interrupts or wants to ask a question uh but uh has there been a moment where you did say almost say f all of this i'm gonna go i'm gonna go work on film i'm gonna go do my dream like you know i'm gonna quote unquote be selfish <laughs> yeah yeah actually i considered it in the last within the last uh year to two years um and and for several reasons i mean one again like we would all really rather be doing something else. Like, first of all, like within the movement, there's community and that's part of the beautiful part. Like we build community with it, but we would all rather not have to fight for our human dignity. Um, and so, 
you know, I think a lot about film um, and, and that, and that aspect, you know, but I'm not sure, you know, we would have the same inspiration and, you know, like perspectives on the world. It's really super interesting um, to think about um, for that, you know, in that regard. But I will say, look, I thought about it. The reality is um, one, you know, this work isn't, isn't profitable and we all have to deal with the realities of like capitalism existing under capitalism um, and, you know, our ability to get by, not only get by, but take care of our own um, and, and, and hopefully leave the next generation if we're, if we're looking to build families in a better situation than we are, you know, and, and as someone who um, grew up here, uh, just like many others, right, I have a, a, a pretty large amount of student debt. Um, and so when you think about, you know, that, that debt um, hanging around our necks and you think about, again, going back to politics, politicians that will fight for, um, you know, the forgiving of uh, student debt, you know, like a Bernie Sanders are folks that, again, you know, really inspired by in this political moment. But, but not only that, like, you know, the capitalism and the realities of capitalism, but, you know, those of us who engage in this work have, have uh, survived plenty of attacks. And so, you know, not only do I have a Canary Mission profile, but I've been targeted in right-wing media sources um, and Zionist uh, media sources for some time now. And you know what, that, that impacts not only you, but your family and your, you know, your family starts to ask you like, how much longer are you going to take this? Um, they write some really terrible things about you. Have you read what they said about you? You know, these are things that your family members are, are, are actively dealing with too. So there was a moment really right around a year or so ago, two years um, that I considered it. Um, and I thought about maybe opening up a legal practice um, and, you know, doing what I can to just um, exist within the system, within the system and, then, and then pushing back in other means, like donating to other folks that are doing the work, right? Like it doesn't need to be a complete like cold break, but I was thinking, you know, maybe I occupy another role and I could be one of those donors that we always look to um, to really help support our grassroots movement. Donors like that, you know, keep USCPR going and, and PIA going, right? And, and all of these institutions going. But, you know, ultimately, I think, um, you know, I am who I am and we all, we all have a certain skill set to be of service of the movement. And so this film I'm talking about is actually of the movement too. And so it wouldn't have been a clean break because I also, even in, in my passion for film, I want to tell the story about Palestine and the work that we're doing and the history of Black and Palestinian solidarity. And so um, ultimately, I am who I am and I, and I just re recommitted to that. And that's, that's it's, it's like precisely when the opportunity at USCPR opened up. And I've really just, again, found it a privilege and an honor to be able to serve as ED at USCPR. Oh, and we are glad you are there, Yatik al Um Ahmed, we can listen to you forever. And your experience, I think, um, is one that many people can relate to and a story that should be told, I think, not just here in the States, but globally. Um, what, on that note, like, what advice do you have for people trying to get into this work, people struggling in this work? Um, and if there is like a Palestinian quote or, or film or poet, like what, what keeps you going? So it's a double ended question because we want to make sure we get as much from you as we can in the next five minutes. You're on mute. Yeah, thank you for that. So the first thing I'll say is as far as advice, um, I think each of us, again, really what I was alluding to in this last uh, answer is this, each of us has a skill set here. Um, each, each of us has a vehicle for contributing um, to this greater liberation project. And so, for instance, for Nader, you know, I, I see what you're doing again with PIA. I think, like, folks should, should recognize these examples, whether it's PIA or Unbought Power um, or you know, uh, the USCPR or any of these other institutions, like that, that really they're outlets for individuals to utilize their skill sets in the greater liberation project. So people should think really intentionally about what their contribution is. And, and I was just lifting up film. And so for, for many folks, you know, it doesn't need to be, 
you know, the person that's like um, on Capitol Hill advocating, you know, maybe they want to support and sign a petition, but maybe they really see their service being in, in arts and culture and poetry and maybe the restoration of, you know, uh, old um, Palestinian uh, cultural activities like the Debka that we want to keep like central to not only like family and communal gatherings, but to resistance, you know, so maybe there's something to that. And so I think for each of us, we need to figure out what our contribution is and what's really um, a central part of our passion. Um, and then utilizing that to be a part of um, this greater liberation project. And now as far as like something I've drawn on, um, always want to lift up Mahmoud Darwish, um, you know, the famed Palestinian poet, uh, you know, because I think he could just um, explain things, um, you know, in a much smoother and, and, and articulate way than I can. And, and I think about um, a stanza he had from the poem Diary of a Palestinian Wound. Um, and the specific stanza I'm referencing, um, he says, oh, my intractable wound, my homeland is not a suitcase and I am not a traveler. I am the lover and the land is the beloved. And that meant a lot to me. The first time I actually saw it was on that first delegation of Palestine. We went to the Mahmoud Darwish Museum and there's a gift shop and we looked at these hoodies that literally had that written in Arabic and maybe five of us um, purchased that hoodie um, and, and many of us still have them till today. And it was just incredibly um, inspiring and, and just eloquent and powerful for me as a Palestinian who had grown up abroad, who was born in Al-Quds, but has, has to get a permit from the Israelis to enter Al-Quds, someone who, you know, has dreams of like um, the, the, the memories of my grandfather when he lived in Haifa. Like I, I you know, there's such a connection to the land and yet here we are with our suitcases every time we um, we attempt to go home. So that, that one was really powerful for me. I think that was very well put and a perfect way for us to close out our interview with you, Ahmed. I really appreciate you giving us the time. Um, before I close this out really quickly, we have about a minute left. Uh, is there any uh, causes or anything you want people to go check out? I know you guys were doing planting olive trees. I don't know if you guys are still doing that, but if there's anything, please, quickly. <laughs> yeah, well, shout out to PIA and I'm about power. You know, I think it's all about building up uh, the folks that, that help build and lift us up. And so shout out to all the institutions that are a part of this collective movement. Thank you to you all. I hope folks can support you all and your ambitions. In addition to that, yes, Rooting Resistance is our campaign to plant olive trees which are a part of Palestinian resistance um, in Palestine. And so please donate if you can. Visit uscpr.org to find out more. Thank you very much. Follow us on Instagram, 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 Instagram. We need to get to 10,000. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you. You guys were just listening to the Palestine in America podcast. I'm your host, Nadir Ahmoud. I was joined by my co-host and our politics edition guest editor, Russia Mubarak of Umba Power. We had on today's episode... U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights Executive Director Ahmed Abuznaid. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you guys later.